thanks everybody for joining us today for this webinar on the future of Christian schools in Australia. My name is Dora Budge, I'm the DBA State Director for Family Voice Australia, and I'm joined by Andrew McCall. So Andrew, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dora. It's great to be with you. And thanks again for our guests today will be Mark Spencer um, at this stage. And Mark Spencer is the Christian Schools Advocate for Christian Schools Australia. And uh, he's got 30 years of experience. Tell us a bit about yourself just to cover us off, intro, intro yourself. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, yeah, I've been, uh, as I said, uh, a bit over 30 years now with uh, Christian Schools Australia. So CSA is the, the largest uh, association of uh, Christian schools uh, in the country. We've got member schools across 180 locations uh, around Australia, uh, educating over 72,000 students in those, those schools. Um, so our schools are, are part of the sort of new wave of, of Christian schools from 40, 50 years uh, old uh, in most cases, and really trying to be genuine communities of faith, really focused on, on teaching from a biblical perspective across all the subject areas, and doing that within a community of faith where all of our staff share uh, the, the beliefs of, of that, that, uh, that school. Um, so, you know, very much about, about offering a genuine Christian education to, to parents who are wanting it. Mm -hmm. And it's essential, isn't it, that uh, obviously parents of all backgrounds have the choice to send their kids to that kind of Christian schooling, to have the values affirmed that they have at home, also affirmed in their schooling environment. Nick, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your background? Obviously, you've had a huge background in child advocacy. You're a member of parliament for in the upper house for the Liberal and Liberal Party there. So tell us about yourself, Nick, and your interest in Christian schooling. Uh, thanks, Daryl, and, and thanks, Andrew, and thank you for the invitation to participate. And uh, obviously, when I acknowledge uh, Mark uh, and his tremendous role that he has played over a long, long time uh, in the Christian schooling uh, movement. Uh, for Matt, myself, it's coming up to 15 years in the West Australian Parliament as a member of the Upper House. Uh, prior to that, a decade in law. Uh, I am the uh, proud father of uh, five children, all of whom have been through the Christian school uh, movement. Uh, as I myself did, I had the great privilege of having all of my 12 years of uh, schooling here in in Western Australia at Rehoboth Christian uh, College and I'm very much indebted to my parents for sending me there and also um, for each and every one of the teachers um, who unsurprisingly were all Christians and um, proud Christians uh, and uh, you know very much had a big impact upon uh, me and as you can see then it's been a generational uh, thing for us so this is an issue pretty close to my heart uh, I know that the what is often referred to as the left of politics often like to talk about lived experience. But when it comes to the Christian schooling movement, uh, I very much have a lived experience and I believe that uh, my story is as valuable as anybody else's. Mm, indeed, that's right. So we're, we're, it's, we're presenting with a bunch of challenges at this point. We've got some national level challenges and some state level challenges. Um, we'll talk through first, I think we'll go to the state level first here in Western Australia, actually, no, we probably should be the national stuff first, sorry. So for Mark and, and for yourself, Nick, what is the Australian Law Reform Commission proposed to change in the Federal Sex Discrimination Act? Can you get, run us through what the challenges we're facing there? Sure, thanks, Daryl. And look, firstly, just to give people a bit of context, the Australian Law Reform Commission is a statutory body, it's, it's separate from government. But it's been charged by the federal government, by the Albanese government, to look at the Sex Discrimination Act and propose amendments to the Sex Discrimination Act that seek to ensure that you can't discriminate against students or staff, um, but also that you uh, can also, for, for schools like ours, maintain and continue to build a community of faith by giving preference to staff who, who share the same belief. So that was the terms of reference given to this statutory body. Um, now, the process they've followed is to release back in January this year a, a consultation paper. Uh, so a paper with a whole series of recommendations and proposals for people to uh, respond to. And frankly, it was outrageous. It proposed the most draconian set of uh, am amendments to the Sex Discrimination Act that have ever been put on the table. 
far worse than any previous inquiries, far worse than any proposals, even from the far left of politics. It proposed changes to the Sex Discrimination Act that really would have allowed the courts to determine uh, effectively who we can employ uh, in, in Christian schools and what they can believe. Uh, and it's not, sorry, it's not just Christian schools, it's all faith-based schools. So Christian schools, Islamic schools are in the same boat. Um, it effectively allows the courts to determine what are acceptable and what are not acceptable beliefs that we can expect staff to adhere to. So it fundamentally would have changed the nature of, of our schools as Christian schools and effectively removed the ability of parents to choose a school that held and taught traditional Christian values and beliefs, which uh, more than 74% of parents in a recent survey we did, of over 8,500 responses, said that's the reason why they're, they're choosing a Christian school like ours. Mm -hmm. And from your, your perspective, Nick, um, what do you see as the, the challenges being proposed in this Law Reform Commission report? Um, we're going to probably see a new, we're going to, we're promised a new one on the 31st December as well. Um, so what do you, what's your response to these proposals and possibly some amended proposals? So Daryl, you, you're referring to the Australian Law Reform Commission. You know, That's the Australian right. Law Reform Commission. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, mind you, that they they're, they're quite uh, similar in terms of their uh, drivers. Uh, my my primary uh, concern, Daryl, is that these uh, the authors of these changes or these proposals have still fundamentally misunderstood the purpose of Christian schools. And until such time as they actually understand what the purpose of Christian schools are, then I really feel that we're bashing our head against the brick wall uh, with, with some of these authors and some of these advocates. Uh, the starting point has to be a discussion around who is responsible for the education of children. Yeah. Now, if it is the case, as you and I and, and others, I imagine, on this um, webinar believe, if it is the case that it is parents who have the primary responsibility for the education of their children, then that is not to say for a moment that the government has no role. It's simply recognising that parents have that primary responsibility. Now, I've given this example on a number of occasions in different forums. Nobody would question the right of a parent to be able to choose who is the babysitter for their children. If mum and dad want to go out for date night on any particular night of the week, let's call it a Friday night, and they want somebody to look after their children, nobody would question their absolute right to determine who will be looking after their children for those, let's say, two or three hours. Now, as we know, at a, at, a, at a school, any school, it doesn't have to be a Christian school, it doesn't even have to be a faith-based school, at any school, teachers and all staff there are doing far more than merely babysitting, far more. But we don't challenge for a moment the right of the parents to be able to choose the babysitter on date night. So why is it now suddenly such an issue that a parent might like to choose who is going to be educating their children. These people are standing in the place of the parents for six hours of the day, five days of the week, 40 weeks of the year. It's a massive investment in time that the parents are, are giving to these stand-in educators on their behalf. So of course, just like the babysitter for two or three hours, the parent is going to want to be able to choose who is that person who is not only going to be looking after their child for safety purposes, but what are they going to be talking about? How are they going to be addressing discipline? How are they going to be talking to them? And of course, in the Christian school movement, we say that all of these things should be informed upon biblical principles. Now, if, if a, a lawmaker, a policymaker, an author of these reports cannot understand those very basic principles, it's no wonder that we get the proposals that are before us. So I think that there is a huge responsibility on our part to, um, to not assume that any of these lawmakers, particularly parliamentarians, we must not assume that they understand this. We don't know what their particular background is. This might all be, everything we're discussing here might be seen like a foreign language to them. That's okay. There is an opportunity for them if they truly believe 
that uh, as uh, members of our modern democracy, they ought to be listening to their constituency to be able to listen to the lived experience of people, uh, then we have this opportunity to have this conversation with them. So I'm sorry, Daryl, you've got me started um, on this topic. <laughs> yeah, hard, yeah, yeah. hard for me yeah. to stop. Indeed. And I've got similar experiences with you being educated in a Christian school and, you know, Christian schooling will always be part of my life and my kids going forward. So I'm very passionate about it like yourself. So what has the WA government proposed to change in terms of reviewing exemptions here? And how, do, how is it similar or different to other states? It's been a fascinating journey over the last 12 months, actually, Daryl. It was looking pretty bleak 12 months ago in about August, if I remember correctly, the Western Australian Law Reform Commission handed down its final report. Um, uh, a lot of people who are probably participating in this web webinar um, were involved in a massive petition to the West Australian Parliament, more than 10,000 signatures. For those in other parts of Australia, uh, 10,000 in a West Australian context is a very significant figure. It's very rare to get a, a number that high. Um, and that obviously um, caused the government to to think twice, but they were still committed to proceeding with the WA Law Reform Commission recommendations. Certainly we can provide them to people offline um, if needs be, but it has the same uh, uh, line of thinking and drivers as what Mark was referring to, to earlier. It was very much about impinging upon the existing exemptions in, in the Equal Opportunity Act of 1984. Now, um, there was then a couple of responses from the government to that petition because it went off to a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, the Attorney General responded, the Minister for Education uh, responded. It was still looking uh, quite bleak. The real game changer was then the uh, Australian Law Reform uh, Commission uh, process. And that has clearly changed the attitude of the WA government, uh, thankfully. And rightly, because of course they will have realised, well, if the federal government's about to make some changes to the national law, uh, then you know, it's a basic principle of constitutional law that if there is an inconsistency, then federal law overrides state law to the extent of that inconsistency, at least anyway. So they needed to know and they still need to know. So basically everything's gone on hold in WA. I'm not unhappy about that because the current landscape in Western Australia is okay. I wouldn't describe it as brilliant, uh, but you know, Western Australian Christian schools and faith-based schools can operate into the current environment. We just don't want government interference into that. And the, the surprising thing about the WA Law Reform Commission was uh, that they simply adopted uh, the proposal of cutting and pasting from Victoria. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's, you know, for a, a body charged with determining WA's state laws to simply propose a, a cut and paste from Victoria uh, was simply not, not doing enough work on, on that. Well, that's uh, right, Mark. And, and of course, especially as we all know, everything's going, been going brilliantly in Victoria. There's been no problems there, of course, right, with their, their laws and legislation. I mean, it's just unbelievable that a, a, a set of lawmakers and law proposers, proposers uh, could copy and paste and other regimes amendments when there have been known problems. Yeah, yeah. And and again, uh, those amendments would have severely curtailed the ability of of faith based schools, Christian schools in in WA, to be able to provide parents that choice. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a choice that is that is fundamental in international law, a choice that's protected as an absolute right under Article eighteen four of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, mm -hmm. to which Australia is a signatory. So we're not talking about rights at the periphery or rights that, that, that don't have any legal status. We're talking about fundamental human rights, strongly protected in international law, that are just being trashed in, in, in local domestic law with these uh, proposals that, that make it so onerous and so burdensome for faith-based schools to simply do what, what parents are asking them to do. Yeah, so then moving on to... Um, what uh, is likely to be the next proposals from the Australian Law Reform Commission? What we expect it to be when this 31st of December report is handed down? What are we expecting? 
How's your crystal ball, Daryl? <laughs> <laughs> and, and look, uh, to their credit, the, the Albanese government gave the, the uh, Australian Law Forum Commission ex uh, an extension uh, because there was so much pushback against these, these proposals. Like, they were so outrageous that, that they really got faith communities uh, worked up. Uh, our, our, our bodies, Christian Schools Australia, took the view that we couldn't make a submission because there was no point in making a submission. They were so bad and the initial timeline was so short, we didn't think that any, anything could, could come of it. Now, the Albanese government keeps uh, pointing to their, their pre-election commitments to ensure that we can have uh, the ability to, to preference staff, to employ the staff we need. But these are, are complex legal issues. And, and you know, Nick, as a, as, a, as a lawyer, will understand you know, the complexity of law in this area. It, it's not well understood. It's, it's hard to explain to people. What we're fundamentally wanting is that simple right to be able to choose staff who share our beliefs. And that, that shouldn't be that difficult. It does mean that, that, that and, and you know, for us, it includes beliefs around gender and sexuality, it includes beliefs around marriage, around traditional uh, beliefs that you know, five years ago weren't that controversial. Um, the sort of amendments that they're looking at possibly removing from the Sex Discrimination Act were ironically introduced by the current federal attorney general when he was last attorney general in, in 2012, 2013. And they were so non-controversial, they, they didn't even go through the House of Reps in the main chamber and put to a vote. They were dealt with off to the side in the Federation Chamber. Now, they were simply just you know, non-controversial. And they've been in place for over a decade or nearly a decade now. Um, without any any problems the impetus for these changes really was some lies put around in a political context uh, around the the wentworth uh, by-election back in 2018 where people were claiming that you know faith-based schools were expelling gay kids left right and center not provide any evidence of that happening by the way and they're using those sort of false claims to drive a narrative that there's a problem that needs to be fixed um, what, what there is is a, a solution that needs to be found around balancing those rights and giving everyone some clarity going forward. And that's what we've been proposing. That's what we're hoping the government will come up with. But until we actually see uh, the report that the RRC is giving to government and then we see the response from the, the Albanese government, hopefully in partnership with a updated religious discrimination bill, because that's part of the same you know, whole uh, jigsaw puzzle we're looking at here, we can't have amendments to a sex discrimination act without looking at what they're going to do around protections against religious discrimination, including the positive right to be able to employ staff who share our beliefs. Now, if we get those two things in place and get bipartisan support from a sensible bill, we'll all move to, uh, together towards next Christmas, Christmas 2024, happy and content, and, and with that, our society in a much better place. But there's still a long way to go before we actually see what the RRC is proposing and how the government will, will be responding. Daryl, can That's I just pick up on a point that Mark's yeah. made there? Yeah. He, he quite rightly referred to the government's um, commitment about allowing uh, us, uh, and I use the word us because uh, every parent, as I say, is responsible, responsible for the education of their children, uh, to be able to employ the staff that we need is the, is the term that's being used. Now, the problem, of course, Daryl, is that here is again where we have the fundamental misunderstanding because I have heard this said in multiple occasions in the West Australian Parliament, including by experienced legislators, they say all you guys need, all you guys need is to be able to employ a Christian or the religious class or the Bible class and they actually believe that to be true. Now, again, in some respects, it's not their fault that they think that, but it, it just demonstrates a fundamental misunderstanding as to why Christian schools exist in the first place. Yeah. So we absolutely need to hammer home the point that when we say the staff that we need, we need all of the staff to be Christian, not just some of the staff. It includes the mathematics teacher. It includes the history teacher. You can't teach history properly in a Christian school, or you ought not to, on behalf of the parents of Christians, Christian parents, if you're not going to be able to explain to the students that what has happened here is that something has been created, the fallen state of man, why there are themes of death and resurrection constantly in history that repeat itself, 
Uh, these are very, very important principles that need to be taught by a Christian teacher to Christian students on behalf of Christian parents. Yeah. The thing with regard to mathematics, where did it all come from in the first place? Right? And if, if you're going to have parents who want their children to be educated in that fashion, then you're going to need to have all teaching staff who are Christian. Now, then you see, it's not just teaching staff that we want who want to be Christian because we want the administrators to be Christian. We want the gardener to be Christian. I remember in Parliament once, one of the Greens members a few years back said she couldn't understand possibly why um, it needed to apply to the gardener. Well, with all due respect, I know that at Christian schools, the gardeners do more than just gardening. What happens when there is a, a two students... Uh, who are involved in some kind of a fracas between the two of them and the gardener intervenes. Would the parents who send those children to that school like the gardener to be able to intervene in that situation in the same way, in the same manner as those Christian parents would do if they had that person babysitting their children for date night? Yes, they would. And so that's why we need to make sure that that these lawmakers and these authors of these proposals understand that it is all staff, not just the staff for the real, the so-called religious class, whatever that's really supposed to mean. Yeah. Every single class and for every single staff member, and it should be okay for us to do that. And those who don't agree with us about that, that's okay. Don't send your kids to this school because that's what we believe and that's what we want. And if you would like something else, no problem. There's a plethora of other options available for you. Yep. And, and that's what we've been saying to MPs for, for decades now, Nick. And uh, you're, you're probably a bit more generous than I. I think some of them just choose not to listen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got some wonderful stories and we've been collecting a whole a whole bunch of stories from the staff of Christian schools and the parents of Christian schools at a, a website, mychristianschool.au. And... Uh, you know, you're hearing parents talking about not just the teaching staff and their interactions with the, their children, but also the, the admin staff, the, the maintenance staff, um, all the staff around, around the school. It, it is a community of faith, mm. uh, and that's what we're trying to be. And, uh, again, if you go to that mychristianschool.au, you can see lots of those stories from parents, from staff about how their faith impacts what they do. We, we've done a survey of uh, all staff across um, a, a number of our schools, over over five and a half thousand responses, um, which we're looking to, to publish early in the new year. And non-teaching staff are talking about, you know, they they recognise how their faith impacts what they do. Parents, they, they're talking about parents and students valuing their faith in what they do in a Christian school. Yep. It is a faith community. That's who we are. That's the type of education we provide. It may not be for everyone. We're happy with that. As you said, there's lots of other choices. Don't take away our choice. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so right at the top, Mark, you mentioned about that being able to manifest your Christian faith is a fundamental human right. It's the most foundational. Uh, I wrote a recent article talking about Christmas as the foundation for human rights. We just celebrated the 70th anniversary of the human rights. Um, I can't remember. It's a convention of some kind. And it's a serious Declaration anniversary. of Human Rights, yeah. Yeah, Declaration, yeah. And it was the 30th anniversary and we're saying, you know, celebrate Human Rights Day just this past Sunday um, and just Sunday before. And the, the foundation of that is obviously the fact that we are created in God's image. We've got this root understanding across our society at some level that everyone is extremely valuable and, and God values them and we value each other in some way. Whatever people then label as God now to themselves, they still value human beings as extremely valuable. But what is the foundational root for that? We're getting just as not that. Um, so that we basically have a new religion being proposed by government that has a completely different understanding of what manifesting your values can be. And we're not allowed to discuss certain values. So, yeah, in talking to MPs of, of various stretches and flavours, they, they bring their particular worldview, saying we like the fruit of Christianity, but we don't believe in the root, the root foundational human right, um, where all of our human rights actually arise from. And that's the struggle that we're having. As it's basically a conflict of worldviews. So, um, my next question, and maybe Andrew can then run through this with you guys. What is the role and responsibility for us as Christians to respond to that? What's a good way for us to respond to all of these challenges? 
So well, for Mark, <laughs> yeah, go on, go on, Andrew. You go on, Mark. Yeah, look, for us as Christian schools, we're fundamentally about uh, two things. You know, we're fundamentally about the gospel and, and the gospel message. Yeah. Um, for, for those who, who may not be, be church-going parents, and we want them to hear the gospel message. We want their, their, young, you know, their, their, their young people to hear that, that gospel message. For those who are church-going parents, we want to help them to disciple uh, their children. You know, the, the, notion, the legal notion of acting, teachers being acting in loco parentis, as, yeah. as, as Nick's mentioned. Yeah. You know, we babysit them. I'll get killed, crucified by all my teacher friends for saying that. Now, we babysit them, to use Nick's uh, analogy, for, for all that time. Uh, you know, six hours a day, five days a, a week, 40 weeks of the year, um, acting in loco parentis. Um, now, we need to do, do that on behalf of parents. It's a fundamentally life-giving, kingdom-building, gospel-centric uh, message. Yeah. As Christians, who wants to stand in the way of the gospel? Um, you know, we, we, we need other people of faith to be taking action, to be uh, supporting uh, the campaign. So the great work that, that Nick's been doing in, in advocating on behalf of the freedoms uh, in WA, uh, at, a, at a WA parliamentary level, um, the work that you've been doing through Family Voice uh, nationally and your numerous campaigns to, to raise these things to the attention of MPs. As Nick's already mentioned, it, it's us. It's on us to actually communicate what we need and why, and to, to tell those stories, explain to to MPs. Yeah. Um, when you when they hear some of these stories, you have those light bulb moments in me sometimes when they actually get it. When they go, ah, now I understand. You're different. Yes, we are different, uh, and we want to maintain that difference. Yeah. So if you're involved in a Christian school, tell your stories. Tell friends. Tell MPs. You know, get involved in campaigns. Go to places like the My Christian School that I use site. Uh, respond to the the calls to action from Family Voice. Sign the petitions that 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 Nick's uh, helpfully organised. Yeah. Um, if you're not involved in a Christian school, just find out what's happening. Continue to keep in touch with Family Voice and take action to these things. We have a voice. Uh, we have the ability in our liberal democracy to to make our voices heard. Absolutely. And our opinions are just as important as anyone else's. We have the good news to share. We want to keep sharing that good news. Yeah. So, Nick, why do you think that Christian schools are good for all students in Australia? The Christian schools are good for um, for all students, uh, all, all children of parents who would like to send their children there. Now, yeah. I, I don't want uh, us to uh, appear, because we are not, I do not want us to appear in any way um, uh, arrogant and saying that this is the only way in which children can be educated. And I know that's not what you're saying in your question to me. Yep. Uh, we, we, it, is a, it is a choice. It is an offering available um, primarily to Christian parents. But if, and it is absolutely the case, I know in many Christian schools across the nation, that um, there are uh, parents who send their children there and they may not necessarily uh, be Christian themselves. Yeah. Uh, now, for whatever reason that they choose to send their child to, their, to that school, that is their choice. Uh, and so Christian schools uh, primarily, primarily are catering for Christian parents and yeah. looking after and educating their children. But it is, a, if you like, a product a service, an offering that yep. is available to everybody who chooses to take it up. We're not ask, we're not telling everybody uh, that they have to do this. We're available to help and look after your children and to educate your children on your behalf if you would like us to. If you don't want us to, we respect that. That's your choice. Yeah, sure. So do you want to do with, with part 4B, Daryl? <laughs> Yeah. So, how do we change that public conversation? Um, we talked, we touched a bit about that, and obviously, uh, one of the other things that you guys have been running a lot of surveys, Mark, through CSA and other Christian networks, we've been running lots of surveys that gather some data about the outcomes for students, outcomes for staff, what parents' responses are. Can you run through some of those results that we've had recently? 
Yeah, we did uh, a very wide ranging survey of uh, millennial graduates. So young people in their, their late, late 20s, early 30s. Um, uh, I think it was uh, nearly 5,000 uh, respondents to that, that survey. And these were graduates from a whole range of schools, uh, Christian schools, Catholic schools, other independent schools, government schools. Um, not trying to pit uh, sectors against each other, but look at uh, how they've perceived that their school experience. Um, you know, for, for some other school sectors, the, the, I think the, uh, the average salaries of graduates from Catholic schools was higher than, than the, the others, um, which I think they were very, very pleased about. Um, now, for us, in one of the standout results as Christian schools was the um, sense of meaning, value and purpose in life the graduates from Christian schools say that they that was instilled in them by their their Christian school education. Yeah. Now, now when you're talking about a uh, and generations as we're increasingly finding who are just suffering an epidemic of mental health issues, um, to have young people with a sense of meaning, value, and purpose in in life, that, that's such a powerful outcome for for Christian schools. Uh, Christian school graduates um, are more likely to be involved in a whole range of uh, activities, volunteering in a whole range of groups, including uh, political parties. Uh, be interested to, to, to you, Nick. Um, you know, graduates from a Christian school are twice as likely as any other school group to be involved in a political party. Um, for your, your colleagues on the other side of the, the aisle in politics, they're twice as likely as public school graduates to be part of a trade union. Uh, you know, they're, they're joining, they're trying to make a contribution to society. Um, so that's where we see uh, you know, Christian schools as having a positive impact to the common good uh, of our nation. These are young people who are joiners, who want to contribute, who want to give back to, to our community, which is a, a great uh, a great outcome that we're very excited about in, in relation to, to Christian schools. Mm -hmm. Again, as Nick said, we're not trying to, to say that you know, we're the only outcome, we're the only option, or you know, and there's, you know, we're, we're not perfect schools. But our schools are making a contribution to the, the common good and they are having great outcomes for, for the uh, young people who are choosing our schools overall. Mm. Now, do you think that um, some of the, the pressure on governments today comes from, from trade unions, particularly the, the educational unions who want to who, who look at the fact that the enrolments for the public schools, and especially Christian schools, are growing, whereas most of the public system is pretty stable, and they see, and, and is it the case that the governments, especially Labor governments, are being pressured by their unions to say, hey, look, please step in here and do something about this so that these public schools are not are stopped from growing as, as much as theirs because our schools are, are you know, losing numbers. It might be the case, Andrew. I, I, I couldn't say for sure, but what I would say is that any pressure that um, any Labor government feels from a union ultimately uh, pales into insignificance compared to the pressure that they receive from the public at large. Right. Because it is just a, a, a statement of fact that every major, well, the two major political parties ultimately want to be in government. And you can only be in government if you've got majority support from the people. So they will, you always get pulled in different directions by different uh, lobby and influence groups and, and the like. And sure. that's just the nature of, of our pluralist uh, modern democracy. Uh, but it is a response. It is a responsibility, I think, at this time, particularly of Christian parents, um, those who have benefited from the Christian schooling movement, people like myself, to not be complacent and to ensure that they participate in this debate. If we are asleep, or if we just say, we don't need to do it because don't worry about it, Mark's dealing with it on our behalf, right? then Mark's brilliant and he's been doing this, but he can't do it by himself, right? It's no point of people in WA saying, well, don't worry about it. Nick's got it all under control. No, Nick doesn't have it all under control. Mark doesn't have it under control. We're just one voice and we need massive support. That's why in the West Australian context, that 10,000 petition was incredibly encouraging. Um, so we need people not to be complacent. If they are complacent, then expect 
there to be bad law changes in 2024 at a federal and a state level. If we participate and we share our story, our, share, our story is a fair one. Yep. There's, there's actually really nothing particularly controversial about anything that we have said today. It ought not to be inflammatory for people because at the end of the day, if they don't like it, they don't have to participate, they don't have to associate with us, they can go to another school. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we are not complacent and we definitely participate, all of us. Everybody who's on this webinar needs to do something in 2024 and commit to doing so, something. Hmm. Yeah, the, the Thomas Jefferson quote, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Mm. Uh, it, it, it does absolutely ring true. And uh, yes, Andrew, you know, there have been over the years some ideologues in, in teacher unions. Um, you know, we were called once uh, garage schools for the chronically religious um, by the New South Wales Teachers Federation uh, who objected to, to us uh, having funding. But that, they are few and far between, to be honest. Um, most people involved in education care about their students and they want all students to, to do well. Yeah, but it is about helping people to understand who we are and what we need. And as Nick said, just take action. It, it doesn't take much to to go to you know, our website, mychristianschool.au, and and you can sign up to keep in touch with our newsletters. You can you can send emails from, from there. It really doesn't take much to to uh, sign a parliamentary petition online. Uh, that they're quite easy to do. To get involved in the family voice uh, activities and respond to your uh, to your messages. Cool. I mean, really, it doesn't take a lot. It just takes a little bit of time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not hard to do that. Um, I'm sure we're preaching to the converted with the people on this webinar. But, you know, if, if the, the people on this webinar can all ask a friend, ask your family member, um, if, if every one of us got five other people, then they got five other people. That's the, sort, that's the way it happens. It doesn't take a lot of people. It just takes the people to actually stand up and say, count on me mm. i mean frankly as, as uh, one of the things i find frustrating in, in in our liberal democracy you know if we're not going to be involved in in policies we're not going to express our opinion how can we say we're really loving our neighbor when we're not expressing that in, through our democratic processes yeah mm. we have the good news this is a way of making sure that good news can be shared with other people yeah why aren't we doing what we can to ensure that good news can be shared yeah excellent yeah. So, and, and that we have, I, I started a campaign a little while ago knowing that the WA government was kind of feeling on the back foot. So, Defend Religious Freedom WA, there's a campaign for our West Australian supporters and the prospect of both the changes to Eco Optionary Act and also possible anti vilification things coming as well. So, you can get involved in that campaign. So, one of the things I, I was really reflecting on, I watched a, a YouTube video last night about the loneliness epidemic, how we as a society are becoming so atomized and so disconnected from each other, not just caused just by the internet age and social media and stuff like that, but we've just, we stopped participating in local communities. And I think this is one of the big drivers of the growth in Christian education is that these communities are so different where people actually genuinely take the time to speak to you and care about you, yeah. that parents actually notice this and they're sending their students off to these schools, whether or not they agree with the values of all of the staff, but they understand the difference in outcomes and they themselves know that their children need to be connected in some way. Otherwise, they're going to just grow up completely, utterly feeling lonely, disconnected, and the social outcomes for that kind of state of mind is tremendous amounts of anxiety, depression, and other outcomes that are just really poor. So we can point to this social uh, research that we have, but also we need to be talking about that um, mm. in, in, in public wherever we can, talking about it with MPs, sending off little messages now and again saying, this is what I believe about the gospel has done in my life, and this is what I've learned in a Christian school. So as you've been pointing out, Mark, that my christianschool.au website is great. It's like, it's not actually behind my family voice and other lobby groups are not really behind it it's just basically very positive very easy to share with anybody and you could just send off a message in some way and understand and read some of the articles there about the the, the positive message that the out, positive outcomes so you can just share that with anybody no matter what their background is and then they can just understand the basic data what's actually going on so your reflections mark and, and nick what do you think is really going on in our society here 
and what is the difference that Christian schools are making for those um, that the loneliness epidemic that we're kind of experiencing and that the data over the last five years has been in the order of like four percent growth in Christian schooling um, and in, just in that specific sector so what do you think is the reasons driving it yeah, I'm not going to pretend for a moment that uh, uh, students who attend a Christian school uh, are never lonely. Mm. Again, I know that's not what you're suggesting. Uh, because uh, those who attend Christian schools are human beings. And so human right. beings uh, in any particular uh, context are going to be prone to various different um, uh, traumas and, and experiences um, and are not uh, immune from loneliness. However, I will say this, that in a Christian school, uh, much like a Christian church, there is inherently as part of the community this sense of fellowship. And, th and that is why we often, um, this is a point that will be misunderstood by many people who don't necessarily understand our worldview, uh, our way of thinking, our way of living, because they will think that the church is, for example, the building and won't appreciate that it's actually the fellowship of believers, the people that are together, who are assembling together, that is actually the church, that body. So for us, the, uh, the concept of fellowship, looking after one another, is inherently part of our community, part of our culture, and that is something that no doubt drives parents to want to send their children to these particular type of schools because they would like that culture and that that sense of community to continue on so i do think in answer to your question daryl that christian schools play a very important role um, in tackling uh, loneliness in all of its forms and the best way it does that is through its um, uh, inherent character around fellowship and um, a community building and as Nick said, I mean, our, our schools aren't perfect and we're not, not claiming that. But let me just, just, just share a story from one of our, our principals shared with me. Talking, we were talking about, you know, why does a bus driver need to be a person of faith? So their bus driver, so this is a school that they have a fleet of buses and, and uh, in their jurisdiction, most of the kids come to school on the school buses. He gets, uh, he actively uh, gets a list of all the kids with birthdays that day on his bus. He'll wish those kids happy birthday when they get on in the morning and ask them, how was your birthday when they get off in the afternoon? If he sees a kid on that bus who you know, is looking a bit out of sorts or knows that the kid's not talking to him or being isolated, he's on the, uh, you know, into the, the pastoral care teacher's uh, room and saying, hey, you might want to keep an eye on, on poor, old, poor old little Johnny. It's always little Johnny. Uh, you, know, you might want to keep an eye on little Johnny. He, he, didn't, he seemed out of sorts on the bus today or what's going on? Uh, the, he, the principal said to me, look, the staff just love this, this bus driver. He just makes such a contribution. He is so integral to their, their pastoral care in that school because he cares. Mm. He, he, he instigated getting the, the list of birthdays. That was off, off his bat. And he's just become such an integral part of what they're doing. And yeah. they've, they've rolled it out with, with other, other you know, bus, buses across the, their fleet. So now it's not just when the kids are at school, they're being cared for. It's when they get on that bus in the morning being picked up. It's when they get dropped off in a bus in the afternoon. Um, you know, those people who are caring for him as part of that community of faith. He does that because of his, his faith. He does that because of his love for that student. He sees him, his driving the bus as being his way that God's allowed him to actually be part of this community and caring for those kids. Yeah. Is it going to solve all the loneliness problems? Not claiming that. But isn't that just a great witness to, to God's love and the, yep. the reason why we need all of our staff to be, be people of faith? Absolutely spot on, Mark. And I mean, it, re it reminds me that as, as parents, um, we are not mute when we drive our children in our cars. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a conversation with them. Now, if somebody else is then going to be driving our children, would we not want to make sure that the character of that conversation was consistent with the type of conversation that we would be having uh, with them? Uh, and so therefore, we should have the right to be able to choose who is going to be the bus driver, who is going to be doing the transportation for our children, because as parents, we're not just parents for moments in time, we're parents 24 hours a day. 
Um, and, and these people are in our place, as you say, in loco parentis. Yeah. It's a, good, a really good illustration, Mark. I should make clear, his most important thing is to get the kids home and, and to school safely. Of course. Um, and he's not talking to the kids all while he's driving, but just, just keeping an eye on the rear view mirror and making sure what's happening on the bus and the behaviour and, and, and all these things, as, as any good um, bus driver would. So, As any parent would be doing if they as were driving. As any parent would be as well, yeah. 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 So we're going to open up for Q&A time shortly. And if you guys got any questions from our audience today, please put them in the Q&A box here on, on Zoom. Um, but I'm going to ask you, Mark and Nick, what do you think is your top three points to respond in terms of what should people do today over the next coming months to actually make sure that we can keep the Christian character of Christian schools? Look, I, I, I'll lead off with the obvious one. It seems like a, a, a trite response in some ways, but pray. Yeah. Um, it actually is a, a vital part of what we're doing. Um, Pray for people like, like Nick and other people of faith in, in Parliament. Pray that they'll be protected, their families will be protected. Pray that they'll have wisdom. Pray that they'll have, they'll have courage. Um, it is, you know, I've been in so many meetings over the years. One of the benefits of being around for a long time is you get to look back and you can see where God's hand has been at work. When people have been praying, when I've been in meetings and words have come out of my mouth and I thought, gee, that's, that's really clever. That wasn't me. And that's just the Holy Spirit just giving me words to, to speak. So, look, if you're a person of faith, and I, you know, I presume many are in this conversation, pray. Pray daily for our MPs, uh, for our leaders and those in authority above us, as Romans says, but particularly those who are of faith, that they'll, they'll have courage and then they'll be encouraged in, in the work that they do. Um, uh, I'm happy for, for Nick to jump in with, with two or three, but I, I, I'll keep going with a second. And... Uh, just read your emails from Family Voice, from, from other groups, and respond. Uh, take some action. It doesn't. It's not hard. We're making try and make it as easy for you as possible to take some action. Please do that uh, as these campaigns roll out and you get this information over the course of next year. If we don't have people responding, there'll be an assumption that people don't care. Now we we know people are busy. We know I've got lots of things on their lives, and and but it really doesn't take that long. Give it a crack. Have a try, make a response, and you'll find it's really not that hard. Yeah, look, I, I uh, support exactly what Mark has said, I, um, and I'm glad that he started uh, with prayer. He's absolutely right. Um, there is the um, the verse in the in the Psalms which talks about unless the the Lord builds it, the labourers are building in vain. Right, so you know everything that we're talking about doing, which is important, uh, because just like the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know we're called to do things, not just to keep walking down the road on our merry way, uh, but the doing has to be done in that context in terms of who's ultimately in control. So, I I totally agree. Um, you know, starting and finishing in prayer is the, is the right place to be. Uh, and just building a relationship with MPs, I know that might be uh, uh, almost an intimidating thing for some uh, of the viewers today, the idea of they might not feel equipped to be able to build a rapport with an MP. My observation then would be you don't have to feel like you need to do it alone. There's absolutely nothing wrong with um, requesting a meeting with your local member of parliament and going as a group of two or three. I mean, don't go, don't go in there with twelve uh, or some huge number, but a, a nice number. You can go and sit down, have a cup of coffee, and explain why uh, sending your children to your local Christian school is important to you. And by by sharing those personal stories, building that rapport, it makes it a lot easier when, at some later stage, there is a proposal for you then to write into that MP. Once you've already got the built the built the relationship, so I, I think that's the single most important thing that people um, uh, can do uh, in this. And and then the last point I would simply make is just keep encouraging your principals and your and your teachers at, at your local school. Far out, they've got a big job, and uh, it, it's it's certainly not any easier than at any other particular point in time. Um, I'm sure every generation of teacher has had challenges and found it difficult and probably says it's the hardest that it's ever been. And I'm sure that's the case for the current cohort too. 
um, but just keep encouraging them uh, because they are doing, I think, one of the most important things uh, that anyone can possibly be doing, which is educating and nurturing the next generation uh, of Australians. So, um, and, and, and that is a, a taxing task. It's, it's not easy being a parent. So if these people are there six hours a day in front of the classroom, standing in our place, it's not easy for them too. So just keep encouraging them. Cool. Amen. So there's a concern from some quarters about how the outcomes for a staff member who may be asked to uh, amend their how they interact, what, what do they do at the school, and also, you know, whether or not they should be asked to, to be just leave the school. Can you quickly run through the process of how that's handled in, in the pastoral and practical sense, Mark, that so that people can just hear from somebody who knows what happens in schools? What's the process? How does it happen? And how that how is that person handled in a way that's sensitive and caring? And look, I should I should make make very clear every case is, is done on a case by case basis. Um, yeah. So it, it's always around looking at at what the context is and and what the issues are and, and how we might might find a way forward. So uh, situations involving staff and I, again I'll just give you an example of uh, um, you know a, a couple in a, in a Christian school they were they were engaged. Um, uh, it was a small country town. They were engaged, and, and the, the lease ran out on, on, on uh, the uh, the bloke's um, uh, rental. He was he was in uh, six months before they get get married. He just uh, moves in with uh, his fiance. Now, now that's obviously a problematic uh, in the context of, of uh, the sort of stance of, of, of Christian behaviour, um, and you know, that became a problem for the school community. They said, "How, how can you teach the, these things about?" You know, uh, marital fidelity when when you're in this situation. Once the school became aware of it, the the, the principal had a conversation with the the, the young guy. You know, he explained it was you know, just a young guy being pragmatic and wanting to save save some bucks. And the principal said, "Look, I've, I've got a spare room." Um, yeah, and and he actually, and it was a little awkward, I can imagine. But uh, he he you know, lived with the, with the principal for six months until he until he got married. Um, now, that's the sort of pastoral response we'll, we'll try to take. And when, when people are prepared to work with us around that, you know, we can find positive outcomes. Now, if that staff member had said, you know, quite differently, well, I don't care what you think. I, I don't care. Look, I, I'm happy here with my, my fiance. We're going to get married. You know, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. You, you can stick your beliefs up your jumper. Then, then we're dealing with a whole lot of different things. Yeah. And, and that's part of the challenge of the law. The, the law is a blunt instrument. And it, it, we need to provide space for us to partially care with care around some of these issues uh, in, in a way that's going to to you know, reflect our beliefs, obviously, and retain that truth. But but speaking the truth in love, as Scripture says, yeah. trying to do it in a, in a loving, caring way. Um, so you know, often these are painted as as black and black and white, but they're 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 always dealt with in a pastoral way, and, and in a way that that actually reflects. The, the values of, that uh, you know, we have as schools, including about caring for people. So another question is about the constitutionality and the international law in terms of Australia being a signatory of these things. What What is your response to, what are the obligations that the Australian government and the states are actually under regards to that? I'll hand pass this to a lawyer to answer because it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, oh, look, I mean, how I would describe it, um, Daryl, at the end of the day, is more a moral obligation than anything else. I mean, there's no point of Australia signing these um, international declarations and treaties if we're not going to adhere to it. Then Australia's signature means nothing. Uh, you know, is there, if you like, this, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not in the same context as a breach of, the law at a state or, or at a national level. Um, you know, who is this big policeman that's going to come along and then say, look at Australia, you've done this and that's inconsistent with this particular arrangement. I mean, you can see how the international community deals with differences of opinion and, and international conflicts, even wars uh, and, and the like. It is more a, um, 
a, a case of pressure uh, and a statement of intent uh, and, as I say, a moral obligation to be able to follow these things. So I think that, uh, you know, Mark quoted it earlier, uh, we absolutely should be making the point that Australia is a signatory um, and they should be expected to adhere to this. Otherwise, just tear up the arrangement and let the rest of this international community know that we're not really actually a signatory uh, any, anymore. Yeah. And the other point to, to make too, I mean, there may be laws that, that are eventually decide, determined to be unconstitutional, but that's going to require a long and expensive process um, through the High Court. And that's, that's all resources that should be used for the education of children, not put in the pockets of lawyers, much as we love lawyers, um, you know, trying to defend these, these matters. We have parliamentarians who are, you know, are charged with making laws and we'd hope that they make clear laws. It means we don't have to end up with, with court battles to try to work out what the laws are saying. Um, and that's some of the issues in, in other areas of law where they're, where they're just introducing laws that are arguably deliberately grey and to try to cause confusion and so uncertainty and fear. Yeah, we definitely don't want to be relying on um, having to make <coughs> high court challenges, uh, you know, claiming that the state law is inconsistent with the federal law and, and seeking a declaration from the court. We we don't want that. I mean, that that is just, um, well, I mean, it's fraught with risk because who knows um, what a particular group of judges on a particular day are going to say. Uh, we don't want that. We just want it to be clear in the legislation in the first place. And that, as is the case in you know 90% of cases, I mean, very few cases end up before the High Court's need, needing a declaration. So we certainly don't need it in this instance. Another question is about regards to funding and the go government putting strings attached to funding. Mm -hmm. What's um, Mark Spitzer, what's your response to that? And as well as you, Nick, I'll start with you, Mark. Yeah, at the moment, the issue is not around funding. Um, we, we have requirements around funding, which is provide for the provision of education. Uh, and that's what we're doing and doing it well. So the requirements around funding are to, to teach the Australian curriculum and to, to be not for profit and various other very, very general requirements. Um, the, these threats have been introduced through discrimination law. Um, and uh, in, in some states, uh, indirectly through registration requirements. So it's less about funding coming with strings. It's more about their, you know, they're, they're challenging our right to exist in, in some cases around through registration requirements, um, whether we can actually operate as uh, a school. Uh, so that, that's where the challenges are more than funding. Uh, funding is, you know, supporting parental choice. And there's, there's been fairly strong bypass and commitment to that. Although, you know, we still are seeing some of the fights around whether public schools should be funded more um, at the moment. You're seeing that play out in the, the public discourse. We, we support well-funded public schools. We want parents to have a choice. And at the moment, uh, that, that choice has been allowed fairly freely. The funding issue definitely um, rears its head, Daryl, in this uh, debate when it suits particular proponents of the debate. I know in the West Australian context that twice I have heard um, from senior government ministers essentially the line to say well look you know you guys are happy to take the government money so you're just going to have to um, deal with the government expectations and once again this is a fundamental misunderstanding um, and actually uh, they demonstrate that they're poor students of history in, in saying that uh, the first starting point has to be that uh, it is not the government's money, it is taxpayers' money. And so every parent is a contributor to that. So of course they have equal right to see the disbursement of their taxes, of their money uh, towards the education of their children. I mean, that's why there's been talk, I know for decades of the idea of a voucher uh, system and, and, and so forth. So um we really need to break down these uh, false arguments that sort of suggest that it is the government's money and therefore christian schools need to adhere to the government view of the world no no it's actually taxpayers money and it is actually not the responsibility of government 
to educate children. It's parents' responsibility and the government has an important role to facilitate that responsibility. Uh, so I would just encourage people when they are having the conversations with the members of parliament, build rapport. You don't need to be expert in your narrative. Uh, you, you, you just need to build a relationship with them. But the starting point is the important principles. Who's responsible for the education of, of children? What's the rightful role of, of government? Um, and then when the rubber hits the road and things get really, really difficult, uh, you'll be in a position to be advocate strongly. What would think, um, regards to what has been proposed, one of the interesting areas is that governments are backing away from uh, about gender identity conversion therapy bans and backing away from that in some quarters and still proposing they want to ban therapy regards to sexual identities and stuff like that. What, how is this going to impact on Christian schools? And what do you think is that should be our responses to these particular proposals with regards to so-called conversion therapy? Look, to start off here and be very clear that, that no one is supporting uh, coercive practices that, that are imposed on people without their consent that seek to, to uh, change their, their, their sexual orientation without you know, them wanting to. Uh, and, and force them to, to do that. So, so no one's no one's proposing or supporting any of those sort of coercive practices that come to mind when when people use the terms like conversion therapy or conversion practices. Right. But what these so-called laws do is, for a start, they they've uh, and I'll use Victoria as, as the example, which has got the probably the most draconian legislation in the world. So it's not just about sexual orientation; it's also about gender identity, an area where there's a whole lot of uh, competing medical views and we've seen overseas with the, the CAS report in, in the UK and, and many of the Scandinavian countries and even uh, in recent days the uh, the Royal Australian College of um, Psychiatrists I think it was uh, in Australia has updated their guidelines acknowledging that there are a range of views around how best to support and, and uh, treat young people who might be struggling around their gender identity. Um, so Despite that sort of uh, uh, medical uh, uh, understanding that there are, you know, it's a complex area and a range of different options, these so-called conversion therapy laws impose a one-size-fits-all uh, affirming care, is the, the language they use, only approach. So the Victorian legislation, again, is, is the example. They give a complete carve-out for affirming care. Um, other medical practitioners who don't want to go down the affirming path have to be able to justify it based on professional stands and their own professional judgment, which again exposes them to litigation and, and it's complex to, to do. Um, the Victorian legislation outlaw, outlaws on the face of legislation prayer. It, it doesn't uh, allow consent uh, for anyone. So what they, they've done in Victoria is outlaw any practice that they say seeks to change or suppress uh, a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, now, one of the examples we've, we've had from a Victorian school is uh, you know, a young girl who might be uh, on the autism spectrum um, and uh, often uh, people in that situation will struggle with change, comes to, to puberty and starts to menstruate and finds that you know, a challenging, uncomfortable, awkward process. Um, you know, is online as many young people are you know, very regularly nowadays. Stumbles across a you know, a group of of activists, and there are lots of them online. Who you know, and someone starts to suggest to her, "Well, it sounds like you really don't want to be a girl. You, know, you want to be a boy." And if that idea gets gets uh, you know embedded in in their thinking, they start to fixate on that. They might start coming back to school and talking to their parents and saying, "Well, you know, this is uncomfortable. I, I want to be a boy." And in Victoria, for a school there, for parents there, who for, for decades have been working with young people who might be experiencing this and helping them to journey through that stage of becoming a woman successfully, they're now in the situation of saying, how do we actually care for this young person? Now, we're pretty confident that, that this young person would just get through that stage of life successfully and grow into an adult, into a, a woman who can have children later in life, who can live a full and complete life. 
but the legislation in Victoria is very much encouraging and almost prohibiting any alternative pathway but a medicalized treatment of puberty blockers, potentially uh, cross-sex hormones in, later in life, potentially ongoing surgeries that, that has the very real potential of leaving that young woman sterile, unable to have children, subject to constant ongoing medical treatment rather than being able to live that, that full life that schools are bound to help them live in the past. So these, these laws are really imposing that one-size-fits-all approach, which may be the right approach for some students, young people, but it's not the best approach for everyone. And it's not allowing people who are their parents, people who are caring for these young people, to be a part of a holistic approach to that, that looks at, looks at the best interest of that young person and provides a care-based, child-centred approach to making sure they can grow and flourish in who they are and the way God's created them. And that's our concern as, as faith-based schools, that we're not going to be able to properly care for young people, and there's going to be a one-size-fits-all approach that's ideologically driven and imposed uh, upon parents, imposed upon schools, imposed upon medical practitioners, imposed upon everyone in, in, a, in a jurisdiction where it's, where it's in, introduced. And that's also there in, in Tasmania very much as well, as I understand it. Not in Tasmania at this time. Tasmania yeah. is considering these laws. They've got laws that okay. they're now um, are looking at adopting. Um, Victoria is the worst approach. Um, in, in even the progressive jurisdiction of the ICT didn't seek to, to uh, prohibit suppression, so-called, um, because I, they, they knew how problematic it was. And, and Queensland has these laws, but that's, it's more constrained again. Victoria is, is the most out there. You know, for, for in Victoria, because heterosexual sexual orientation is still protected under, under these laws, to simply say you should be celibate until marriage, that's potentially unlawful in Victoria. Mm -hmm. And Nick, what's your response on these, on these uh, concerns? And what's the state of play in regards to that in WA as well? Look, it's all quiet in Western Australia in that respect. Um, but what I would say is that this is, um, uh, my observation is that this is trying to pretend that something that is complex is simple. And uh, dealing with trauma in any uh, of its forms, in any of its manifestations is never simple. And it can be harmful and indeed dangerous to pretend that it is simple. And as Mark says, you know, try and apply a one size fits all approach. Uh, that is inherently dangerous. And it is encouraging to see that there is more and more medical opinion questioning the appropriateness um, of this, uh, shall we say, affirming model uh, so i think that in the christian school context uh, just as we will deal with any other particular uh, trauma uh, we would deal with it compassionately uh, with with kindness um, carefully prudently uh, and we wouldn't rush to simply apply a simple solution uh, to what is a complex trauma and uh, we should be able to do that as parents, as educators, uh, as people who care about others. Uh, we should be able to journey alongside another person for as long as it takes uh, as they're working through whatever the issue it is that they are working through. I see that, Mark, you're helpfully responding to some of these questions live on the, on the chat, which is great answering in detail for um, some of our audience. Um, I think we're going to wrap up fairly soon. So um, do you have any final questions, Andrew? No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Thanks, Dale. Cool. Well, thanks for your time today, gentlemen. Um, I know you're very, very busy and I hope you have a, a wonderful Christmas break and uh, great time with your families. And we can start the new year uh, responding to this Australian Law Reform Commission updated report <laughs> 31st of December and uh, we can respond prayerfully as you've said 
but also practically um, in terms of talking about it in the public sphere and talking about it with the MPs, form a relationship with MPs and just engaging in such a way as we're, we're staying in the, the battle, the, the continuous um, tussle that we're in, um, but obviously doing it with love and compassion. Um, so Mark, Nick, Nick, any final comments? Uh, look, thanks for the opportunity, Daryl. It's a, a pleasure, and, and Andrew, a pleasure to be with you. An honour to be able to share the platform uh, with Mark, who's, as I said, had been so experienced and such a great advocate for Christian uh, parents, schools, and students for uh, decades now. And uh, very, very uh, grateful that you've taken up this opportunity to to host this uh, webinar. Absolutely, I would wish everybody um, a very happy Christmas. You know, Christmas, we obviously get to, to re recognise and celebrate the most important birth um, ever in history. Uh, and, and at that same time, we recognise uh, the importance of new life. And with new life comes hope. Mm -hmm. And so on this particular issue, again, uh, 2024 is just around the corner. And so uh, we can be hopeful for the opportunities that present and, and uh, you know, pray to be good witnesses in the context that we find ourselves in in 2024. And so I just wish everyone every blessing for the year ahead. Yeah, I absolutely uh, echo Nick's comments and look, give give credit to him as well. I, I think parliamentary is a little bit like dog years. Every year as an MP is probably about five years of normal life. It sucks that much out Agreed. of you. So, yeah. you know, genuinely do pray for, for Nick and, and, and our MPs um, and their families who sacrifice a lot as well. Um, um, I've worked close enough with enough MPs over the years to, to know just really what a tough gig it is. Um, they get a hammering in the media. Uh, they get a hammering in uh, across the chamber. Um, it's not fun. And their families are, are part of that as well. So, so please pray, pray for Nick and, and others. Um, thank you, Daryl and, uh, and uh, Andrew and Family Voice for hosting this. It's been great to be part of it. Hopefully it's been, been useful for those who are going to join us online. Um, we have got a Christmas break, time to refresh, be renewed and come back uh, uh, ready to, to be engaged in this process and the parliamentary democracy we have in the new year, making sure we can protect religious freedoms. This is uh, an issue we can be successful on. Uh, this is an issue where we have right on our side and it's an issue that's just so fundamental to the gospel and maintain the freedoms that we, we need in our democracy. It's an issue where it's good for everyone we have freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and freedom of belief. Mm. It's an unmitigated good, and we should all get behind it. And thanks again for having me on. No worries. Thank you, Mark. Thanks thank so you, much. Nick. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Merry Christmas, everybody. And have a wonderful break, and we'll see you in the new year. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>